us. I welcome those of you here in the Lyceum uh, and those watching uh, on the live stream uh, to this special forum to celebrate uh, the publication of this new anthology, Now Comes Good Sailing, which the New York Times Review suggests features a lineup of authors that might be deemed the who's who of intelligent modern prose. So here they are in front of us. <laughs> No, no pressure, but we hope you live up to the billing. <clears throat> now, I wish I could claim that we placed this section of Elm Street on the wall just for tonight's event to match the lovely cover of this new book. Um, but alas, it was hung earlier this fall in part to complement this lovely collage that was done <clears throat> by the artist a Morell of images of Walden Pond. The tree is actually from Barrett's Mill Road in Concord and dates back to 1780, so it was an eyewitness to Thoreau's time, and I, I like imagining that he walked underneath its branches, uh, as possibly one of our speakers this evening, Will Eno, may have done as well. I'm not suggesting, Will, that you're as old as Thoreau, uh, uh, but uh, Will grew up here in uh, Carlisle and attended a part of uh, his childhood and adolescence and actually attended Concord Carlisle High School. Uh, I feel at this moment the way uh, one does uh, when you're at one of those all-you-can-eat buffets with so many delectable dishes to choose from, but knowing there are limits to just how much one can consume in one sitting. We could have hour-long forums with each of these speakers tonight, and you're actually all invited back if you would like to come and have an hour-long forum. I would be happy to uh, facilitate that with you. Um, and we'll likely only scratch the surface of their original and often quite moving essays. Uh, unlike the buffet, at which we end up feeling satiated, however, we hope tonight's discussion will pique your interest and leave you wanting more. So the book is on sale out um, in the hallway after the forum, and I know our authors would be happy to sign your copies. Uh, and you could also go online to watch uh, a virtual forum we organized earlier this month, featuring three of the other authors from the anthology, Gerald Early, Jenny Boylan, and Jordan Salama. Le reading all of these essays was a potent reminder to me of how Thoreau speaks to us through the edges, whether in Gerald Early's case, as a young African-American man living through turbulent times in San Francisco in the late 1960s, or for Jenny Boylan, a transgender pioneer transitioning in a very public manner as a member of a small liberal arts college community in central Maine. Uh, with an audience this size, we would normally have our stage, but uh, we don't have a stage large enough for seven speakers. Um, so you'll forgive the formality, but we're going to have our speakers use the podium just to be sure that you all can uh, see them as they speak. Uh, I want to share one excerpt of Thoreau's writing from our own collection, and I want to leave as much time as I can for our speakers. So I wrote up more fulsome introductions of each speaker, uh, which are part of your uh, program. Allow me to whittle those down to a handful of words for each, and I will offer them alphabetically the way they are seated here. Andrew, Andrew, I didn't ask how I pronounce your name, Blauner? Blauner. Andrew Blauner, the founder of Blauner Books, is the person most responsible for us being here this evening, and he is the editor of this new anthology. Kristen Case is a professor at the University of Maine Farmington, author and poet, and the driving force behind an initiative titled Thoreau's Calendar, a digital archive of the phonological manuscripts of Henry David Thoreau. George Howe Colt is the best-selling author of The Big House, A Century in the Life of an American Summer Home, which was a National Book Award finalist and a New York Times Notable Book of the Year. His other books include Brothers, November of the Soul, The Enigma of Suicide, and The Game, Harvard, Yale, and America, 1968. I was first introduced to the playwright Will Eno by the archivist of the United States, David Ferriero, who describes Will as a prince among men. His play, The Flu Season, won the 2004 Oppenheimer Award for Best Debut by an American Playwright. His other play, Tom Paine, Based on Nothing, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in Drama. Megan Marshall is a professor at Emerson College and the author of the award-winning biographies, including The Peabody Sisters, Three Women Who Ignited American Romanticism, which won the Francis Parkman Prize, and Margaret Fuller, A New American Life, which was the 2014 Pulitzer Prize winner for biography. 
Tatiana Sloshberg is a journalist and former New York Times science writer. Her book, Inspicuous Consumption, The Environmental Impact You Don't Know You Have, about the unseen environmental and climate impacts of the internet and technology, food, fashion, and fuel, won the Rachel Carson Environment Book Award in 2020. Tatiana kindly participated in a virtual forum here at the Concord Museum last April to help us mark Earth Day. Wen Stevenson is the author of What We're Fighting For Now Is Each Other, Dispatches from the Front Lines of Climate Justice, about his journey into the U.S. climate movement during the pivotal years from 2010 to 2015. He served as an editor at The Atlantic and the Boston Globe. Over 10 years ago, he experienced what he describes as a personal awakening awakening and walked away from his mainstream media career in order to write and engage on climate and climate justice. In the 1970s, the museum leaders made a wise decision to take most of our textual materials and donate them to the Special Collections Department at the Concord Free Public Library, where researchers can have better access to them. But we do have one piece of Thoreau's writing from his essay, Walking, which is currently on display in our new galleries. And after, um, during the book signing, if you'd like to see our new Thoreau galleries, you're welcome to do so. And this piece is on display. As my contribution to today's proceedings, I'd like to just share an excerpt from that for you. This is Thoreau writing. We had a remarkable sunset one day last November. I was walking in the meadow, the source of Nut Meadow Brook, when the sun at last, just before setting, after a cold gray day, reached a clear stratum in the horizon, and the softest, brightest morning sunlight fell on the dry grass and on the stems of the trees in the opposite horizon, and on the leaves of the shrub oaks on the hillside, while our shadows stretched long over the meadow eastward, as if we were the only motes in the beams. It was such a light as we could not have imagined a moment before, and the air also was so warm and serene that nothing was wanting to make a paradise of that meadow. When we reflected that this was not a solitary phenomenon, never to happen again, but that it would happen forever and ever, an infinite number of evenings, and cheer and reassure the latest child that walked there, it was more glorious still. As John Kay concludes in his New York Times review of this remarkable anthology, Thoreau speaks clearly, urgently to our time, but only if we are willing to listen and live accordingly. We'll now proceed to listen to brief remarks, and in some cases, readings from this evening's panelists, which will be followed by a conversation facilitated by Andrew, who will lead off now with some opening comments. Before I, before I take this off, as I'm taking this, this is available from the shops at Walden Pond. Uh, and Halloween is coming, so you be the first kid on your block. Um, this is surreal, um, in the best sense. Uh, Tom, thank you for those remarks and everything you did to make this possible. Allison, uh, everybody here at the Concord Museum, the Thoreau Society, Princeton University Press uh, took a chance, really, um, and made a leap of faith. Uh, and I can't thank them enough at being the publisher of this book, uh, particularly uh, Anne Savarese, who's uh, the editor, uh, and I'll say a word about that title in a moment, uh, and Jordi Price, who's just a phenomenal uh, publicist who helped make this event possible. I thank all the contributors, but particularly, I'm just it's, I'm knocked out just looking at all of you here. Virtual is great to participate, but that all of you came from, I was thinking, I think from, from Brooklyn to Brookline, or give or take, um, you've congregated here. It really means a lot, and I really appreciate that. Um, if the Red Sox had not been eliminated and I thought you would all get the reference, I would say that you all hit it out of the park and I want to push you down the aisle in a laundry basket. Okay. So, um, the title of the book, uh, this is sort of a self-selected group here, and those of you uh, um, tuning in virtually, you may know this already. The title comes um, from the last spoken sentence uh, from Henry David Thoreau before he died. Um, now comes good sailing. Um, reportedly, he, he spoke two other words. I believe they were moose and Indian, but now comes good sailing. It was the last sentence that he spoke before he died, and I think... Um, 
we could all use some some good sailing now. And um, the other thing I just wanted to get into very get in and out of very briefly because there's always there's an origin story. And in this case, in this case in particular, I think it would be a logical inference that this book sort of all came about during the pandemic, uh, because as Pagan Kennedy, who's a, a terrific Boston writer, many of you may know her work, she said in the midst of this process and project, we're all thorough now. Um, the fact of the matter is, I had harbored hopes of putting this book together for many years, and it was just an excruciating amount of procrastination that just precluded me from doing it. And as some of the writers may know, as some of you may know, some of you out there may know, it, sometimes you just need something uh, to happen, to catalyze sort of getting over that. And, and along came COVID and, um, you know, the bar was raised, I think, for everybody. It was sort of putting a premium on how you spend your time, your, your work, the rest of your life, what's important, what matters, what's your legacy, all these sort of bigger picture, deeper questions. Um, and, you know, I could feel good about trying to put together a book like this. It reminded me in a way after the Boston Marathon bombings, and I'll, full disclosure, I'm a New Yorker. It's sort of hard to imagine. I, my heart and soul are in, have long been in Boston and in New England, but I am born and bred in Manhattan. But after the Boston Marathon bombings, uh, it summoned such um, emotion, as I'm sure it did for many, if not all of you. Uh, and I thought, what could I do? I wanted to do something to help. In that case, it was to put together one of these books called Our Boston. Um, uh, all for the benefit of the victims and their families in the one fund. That book came together, I was looking at the calendar, the bombings happened in April, the book came out that October. Those of you who know anything about book publishing and when is always laughing behind his mask, know that the glacial pace of publishing doesn't work that way. Um, that book came out six months uh, from the, time, the day of the bombing. In this case, I looked at the calendar 18 months ago, 18 months from going back from now was April of last year. And that's when we were all, I mean, you put it, mark it as March. April was when we were, I think, starting to get our minds a little bit around what was going on. Um, that was when, that was the inception of this project. That's when I wrote this letter sort of posing as a proposal to Princeton University Press, proposing this book. Um, so here we are 18 months later. Um, for all of that verbosity just now, I, I want to say that I want to moderate this about as much as I edited the book, which is to say almost not at all. Um, when you have writers of this caliber and quality and 20 others, as well as Sandra Boynton, uh, the cartoonist, you really, this is not false modesty, it's just fact, and they could testify uh, if they were telling the truth. There wasn't much editing here, uh, hardly at all. Um, so I'm just thankful to have been given the opportunity to sort of play the part and get the ball rolling. And that's basically all that I'd, I'd like to do here. Um, so with that, um, uh, we'll, we'll leave time, I hope, for a little discussion after, but certainly time for a question and answer after. Um, but the last thank you is to all of you um, for being here and for all of you for tuning in, spending part of your Sunday night um, with us. Um, so we're going to go. Um, alphabetically, and there's no need for me to come back after each one, if you could just sort of pass on to the next person and do with your time whatever you see fit, and, and we're going to start with Kristen Case, with my thanks to all of you again. Thank you. It's going to be noisy. <laughs> And I'm going to have to do the embarrassing microphone adjustment. Um, thank you so much. Uh, thanks, first of all, to, to Andrew for um, inviting me to be part of this tremendous volume. Um, it's a really um, an honor. Uh, and, um, and also to Tom and, and Allison for, for organizing and having us here. This is such an amazing space. Um, really a great pleasure to be here and to be with all of you in person. Um, so I, in, in this essay, it was as, um, as someone who's been sort of thinking alongside Thoreau for a long time, uh, it was a great pleasure to take uh, a few days. I actually wrote this essay. I ha had too many um, looming deadlines, and so I, I booked myself an Airbnb and went away uh, <laughs> and, uh, and wrote this essay. Um, kind of all together in about three days um, and didn't do anything else for those three days, really. And uh, that was a great pleasure, and it was a great pleasure to reflect on 
my years of of thinking and um, and reading with uh, with Henry. So that that's a, what this essay is about, kind of my my relationship to him over time, um, and I that that relationship is mostly revolves around. Uh, some manuscripts that I have spent a long time working on called the, the calendar, uh, um, Thoreau's calendar or the phenological manuscripts, the seasonal charts that many of you have probably seen um, or, and or worked with uh, of seasonal phenomena. So um, happy to talk at more length about those later. Uh, following Thoreau, I'm just going to read from the beginning of the essay. Like many, I disliked him at first. The superior tone, the irony, the apparent disinterest in people. And so it was a small surprise to notice one day, maybe 10 years ago, that Thoreau had become my friend. I suppose it's possible that prolonged enough exposure to any writer will create this feeling of intimacy, this sense of living in some strange proximity to the dead. But I suspect that the particular way that Thoreau has made a home for, myself, for himself in my mind, taking up residence in my hands and eyes, becoming part of the way my fingers move across the little black keys of this keyboard, and part of my attention to the not quite silence that surrounds my typing, has something to do with the way that writing and life are always interwoven for him. It is something to be able to paint a particular picture or to carve a statue and so to make a few objects beautiful. But it is far more glorious to carve and paint the very atmosphere and medium through which we look, which morally we can do. To affect the quality of the day, that is the highest of arts. He says paint a picture and not write a book. But of course he means that too. And as a writer himself, means it more. It was always life and not writing he was after in writing. And this is the reason for the sharp respect for the actual that one feels in all those lists in Walden, those accountings to the half penny, those soundings of the pond. It took me three readings of Walden to begin to understand and love this about Thoreau, that he took seriously the question of how to live and wanted that question asked and answered in practical material terms. But I love even more that no answer was ever final, that he kept finding new ways both to live and to tell about it. My feeling of intimacy with him is the result of the, his commitment to this endeavor, his always seeking and finding new ways to represent the life around him and in him, to find, what it was, to find in it what was writable, which is to say what in it was shareable. What strikes me now some years into my friendship with Thoreau is the vulnerability in the asking and re-asking of this question. What does it mean to try to tell our life, to take, in, to take it in and put it back out again in these little black marks? It is a tender question. What is shareable? I first encountered Thoreau's calendar or charts of seasonal phenomena as a graduate student in English, which is to say a person full of anxiety and despair. I lived with my husband in a small ramshackle house in an impoverished rural town on 16 acres, three and a half hours by car from New York City, a trip I would make twice a week for classes and glimpses of the urban life I'd left behind. The house had come with a large and badly overgrown perennial garden, and I spent my non-class hours avoiding my reading and ripping long vines of hops from the ground, a process that covered the insides of my forearms with burning red streaks. That first summer, I made a notebook and drew a map of the garden to keep track of everything that bloomed and when. On the other pages of the book, I drew maps of the roads and abandoned farms that I encountered on my walks, which got longer and longer the more reading I wasn't doing. It's hard to describe what captivated me so much about this work, why it eclipsed for that period my love of reading and writing, which had only, which had only ever been forms of solace and pleasure up to that point. I think it had something to do with the fact that unlike the theoretical and philosophical texts I was attempting to master or believed that I was supposed to master, none of it, not the gardening or the walking or the tracking of these in the little notebook, had to mean anything. Or rather, what it meant was itself. 
If you walked straight across the state land on the CCC road long enough, you'd come to Rossman Hill and pass a handful of old cellar holes on the way. Sedum blooms in August. The hollyhock grows up behind the bee balm. I loved gathering these facts, drawing them into myself and putting them back down again in the notebook. I especially loved the way the garden notes made me think not in terms of years, but in terms of months, each July neighboring the next in memory and experience, somehow much closer to each other than the present July was to say September. It was a whole new way of navigating time. So when I learned about Thoreau's late life charts of seasonal phenomena, hand-drawn grids on surveyor paper, mapping out date and year, the notable, uh, by date and year the notable natural occurrences for each month, ice in ponds or tubs, and first hard frost in October, sultry light and begin to sleep with window open in June, I felt I understood. The work was not to explain or interpret, simply to register what was there, what was happening. It is not how the world is that is mystical, Wittgenstein says in the Tractatus, but that it is. I also felt that I understood the shift in Thoreau's late journal away from the interpretation of facts and toward their ever more replete documentation, a shift that Perry Miller and several decades of criticism after him characterized condescendingly as evidence of diminished imagination. I liked it that as he grew older, this writer who once spent so much ink exhorting us to change our lives, reserved more and more of it for quietly tracking and then registering the existence of the life around him. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Great to see you all. Hi, my name is George Colt, and um, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, my contribution to this anthology had its roots about uh, 21 years ago when my wife and I moved from Manhattan to rural western Massachusetts. Uh, really, we kept telling people we were moving for the sake of our young children, but we were moving for our, our own, primarily for our own sake. My wife and I missed winter. We missed the kind of winters that we'd grown up with in, uh, in New England. Uh, I'd grown up about 20 miles from Concord, uh, skating on the Charles River and playing pond hockey. And I wanted those kinds of winters for my wife and I. And secondarily, I also wanted them for our children who thought that skating meant gliding around with hundreds of other people on the artificial ice of Wallman Rink. So my first Christmas in our new home, my wife Anne gave me a book, and it was a volume from the 1887 Riverside edition of Thoreau's work. Uh, it was an, a selection of excerpts from his journals titled Winter. And so that first winter in our new home in Western Massachusetts, I would read each night about Thoreau's winters, Thoreau's winters of the 1840s and 50s, even as I was experiencing my own rebirth of winter 150 years later. And perhaps the major revelation of the journal for me was how much Thoreau adored ice skating. Like me, like really like most children, perhaps like many of you, uh, he waited for the onset of winter with bated breath. He would go out uh, to the ponds, primarily Walden, but to the others, and see when the first sheet of ice would form. And he'd toss a pebble when he saw that first thin film form to see if it would hold. And then a couple days later, he'd come out and he'd toss a, a little bit bigger rock. And then pretty soon he was tossing a boulder out. And then by then, he was venturing out on his on his own two feet, and a little while after that, he'd, he'd strap on his skates and push off from shore. Now, the thing about Thoreau on skates that fascinated me is that Thoreau on skates seemed to be so different than the stereotype of that grouchy, judgmental uh, misanthrope, uh, a stereotype that really was so ingrained uh, that uh, Henry Seidel Canby, you may know that in his biography of Thoreau, he felt the need in his introduction to say that one of his main tasks of his biography was to convince readers that Thoreau was happy most of the time. <laughs> 
So, indeed, judging from his journals, Thoreau was probably happiest, I think, when he was on ice skates. Uh, Sophia Hawthorne, in a letter to a friend, describes this kind of magical day when uh, she witnessed her husband, Nathaniel, and uh, Emerson and Thoreau out skating on the Concord River. And she described their skating styles. She's, Emerson was stooped over and pushing hard and working very, very self-reliantly, I'm sure. And Hawthorne was sort of lordly and erect, she said, like a self-impelled Greek statue. And Thoreau, she said, uh, she, she actually said he had a rather ugly skating style, which I doubt, but she said he was fither, figuring dithyrambic dances and bacchic leaps. So Thoreau was apparently the Scott Hamilton of the transcendentalists. <laughs> So what did Thoreau love about ice skating? He loved the speed. He would go up to, he once timed himself up to 15 miles per hour. He said, a man feels like a new creature, a deer perhaps moving at this rate. He loved the distances he could travel on skates. One day he skated 30 miles and he loved that on skates he could get to places that he couldn't get to in summer. He said, the deep impenetrable marsh where the heron waded and the bittern squatted is made pervious to our shoes as if if, if, as if a thousand railroads had been made into it. He loved the irregular surface of the ice that made skating oftentimes like a Coney Island thrill ride. He says, now I go shaking over hobbly places, now shoot over a bridge of ice only a foot wide between the water and the shore at a bend, now straddling the bare black willows, now winding between the button bushes and following narrow threadings of ice amid the sedge. I get the feeling Thoreau would have hated Zambonis. Um, and he loved the ice itself. Some of his most beautiful descriptive writing is about ice. Uh, he would study it, he measured its thickness, he measured the bubbles inside it. He used to lie down on the ice uh, and describe the ice that he was looking at and the creatures that would swim below. He drew pictures of ice in his journal. He was absolutely fascinated by all the variations that ice could take. He said, surely the ice is a great and absorbing phenomenon. We do not commonly distinguish more than one kind of water in the river, but what various kinds of ice there are. And one of the reasons um, we were talking earlier about Thoreau's journals versus his books, one of the reasons I love his journals is because you get a sentence like that that he may well use later in a book, but there's breath before and after. His, some of his books are so dense, but in the journals, these amazing perceptions. We do not commonly distinguish more than one kind of water in the river, but what various kinds of ice there are. Who among us, skaters like me, ever thought that there were so many different kinds of ice? Well, of course, um, I felt immense exhilaration as I wrote this essay for Andrew's anthology, um, just reading about Thoreau's own exhilaration. But of course, all the time, it was tempered by sadness at knowing that since Thoreau's time, the kind of of ice and ice skating he was describing was a thing of the past. And of course, all the more so in these last 20 years since my family moved to Western Massachusetts and with uh, increased global warming, um, we could see cross-country skiing areas all around us closing, ponds less and less skatable. Um, my son, who was four when we moved to Western Massachusetts, he grew up to become an avid skater, cross-country skier. He keeps telling me now we should have moved to Northern Vermont. Uh, though I'm tempted to think even northern Canada uh, might not be too far. Uh, I'd like to end on a happier note. Thoreau, 1855. 1855 was an amazing year for skating. He wrote about it and called it my winter of skating. Uh, he used to skate every day that winter, sometimes twice a day. Uh, and one evening he was concluding a letter to his friend Daniel Ricketts, Ricketson in which he described his day. And he ended with a sentence, so... With reading and writing and skating, the night comes round again. Sounds like a perfect day to me. Thanks. Um, hi, uh, Will Eno. Um, language is the most perfect work of art in the world. The chisel of a thousand years retouches it. I believe that that's from the from the journals, um, and I love that Thoreau chose to use the word uh, chisel in reference to something which is, by its nature, sort of, uh, uh, breathy and liquid and even um, invisible. Um, and that I know I understand that's a pretty fancy start for a 
entirely undistinguished graduate of CCHS right up the road. Um, I had a good start there, though. Uh, Mary Roby was a teacher there who was uh, really good and a, a couple of other um, uh, great people. And also, and just to say quickly, um, um, it is, I've, I've never been in the museum having grown up in Carlisle. Um, it is so wonderful to be here. It is, it's an amazing place. Um, and it's, I, I don't know what 40 people said no to you that made you then contact me, but I'm, I'm <laughs> thrilled to be here. I think I was in, um, I think in March 2020, I'm pretty sure when we first spoke, I was staying as the guest of the great Hillary Taylor here, who is a wonderful friend of the family and a local artisan. Uh, Merlin Star Gallery, is that true? Yeah. Silver's Merlin, Silver Star. Um, but she uh, let me and my little family uh, stay up in, a, in a, a, an empty place up in um, Waterville Valley, New Hampshire, and uh, um, was just the picture of graciousness um, at a time when who knew what was going to happen when, and um, that really was an amazing thing. Um, I was hoping to prepare sort of more specific remarks, but we kind of spent the day... Um, my brother John is here. We spent the day raking leaves over in Westford and then kind of unraking them with my daughter Albertine, who I think um, is eating potato chips in the uh, Emerson's uh, parlor exhibit over there, probably. Um, also, I'm hoping um, it was Henry David Thoreau himself who said, uh, the theme is nothing, the life is everything. So I come here with my, uh, my daughter and a bag of something and, uh, and my life. And I wanted to share a couple of um, Thoreau quotes and um, some moments of life. <clears throat> At death, our friends and relations either draw nearer to us and are found out or depart further from us and are forgotten. Um, my lovely mom died about a year ago. And uh, if it doesn't sound strange, she died wonderfully and beautifully and bravely and at home and with all of us around. Um, uh, she started a thing called uh, the, uh, the Walk for Peace, which was up in Concord Center. And every, I think it was every Friday, might be the first Friday of every month, but they would just walk. They had a fairly unaggressive message. It was just, we walk in sympathy with those who suffer from war. And I remember once there was a nun who would join them and someone drove by and uh, gave them the finger and the, the uh, nun said to my mom, is that good? <laughs> um, uh, but my, mo my mom, no kidding, she said the word yay more than any other word in that last eight days of her life. And when she, she then started to clap when she couldn't say the word yay anymore. <laughs> And it was um, it was an incredible thing. It was a she was a guide, a real guide. And I hope, if I'm lucky enough to be able to die and not just kind of turn up dead, I hope that I'm able to make be someone else's guide and uh, be um, make someone else less afraid, like she did. Um, she was um, cremated. She was taken care of by the uh, D Funeral Home right here in Concord, who, who also handled the Thoreau family and the Alcotts and everybody, that whole gang. And um, I didn't think I was going to make a little plug for a funeral home, but um, <laughs> D Funeral Home and cremation, give them a call, you know, give them a call. Was, um, um, I suspect the child plucks its first flower with an insight into its beauty and significance, which the subsequent botanist never retains. Um, I think of my daughter when I read that, who, again, you know, I, she loves princes and princesses. And Tom, if I wish she'd been around to hear me described as a prince, she, I think she would have followed up on that with me later, if, um, but she wasn't. Um, uh, uh, but my mother's ashes over the past year have been on this kind of rodeo tour of the world where just cousins, everybody just grabs a handful when they come to the house and they're all over the place. And my uh, daughter's first, the, she, she, there was not even a beat. She said, oh, we should, we should sprinkle some on a sleeping wolf was her very first idea of what we should do, which my mom, I think, would have just cried at being so 
clearly seen, I think she would have thought, yeah, that would be first first thing, <laughs> Sleeping Wolf. The uh, I think it's up in Ipswich or Exeter, the wolf sanctuary had very strange hours, so we, we have not yet, but that'll happen, I think. Um, uh, um, they are, oh, I, this is probably actually illegal, but there are, in the thorough suite of the Colonial Inn, there's a little sprinkling of my mom's ashes, which I don't think, <laughs> no one will ever find, and they will never bother anyone, but they are there, just because I, she did have this very, uh, she had a, she loved to canoe, she really loved to canoe, we did a little paddle for her, and had a picnic near Egg Rock, which is famous in the Thoreau um, uh, legends, um, uh, so yeah, the Thoreau suite. Um, the voices of school children sound like spring. Um, my daughter at three invented a new word, partibidi, um, which um, when I asked her what that meant, she, she would only say, uh, partibidi is a kind of word. And that was, that was, uh, that was it, um, which is true. Actually, the more I thought about it, that's, that's, that's true. Um, she also recently, though, with her uh, little chisel, came up with the word uh, holiday full, which uh, was for one of those days that is maybe a Tuesday that feels like a Sunday. Um, and I thought it's, uh, I don't think, I think English is a really good language and not impoverished in any way, but holiday full is, uh, does, does some work. Um, and I am feeling that way very much right now. I'm so glad to be here, so grateful to you all. And, um, um, uh, the Red Sox, they, I, you know, God, God love them. Um, and um, I'm just really, and Hillary, it's, you really, you, um, just uh, that, I remember you said, before I even wondered how long we might be staying, you said, stay as long as you like. And we were kind of scared, you know, with all that stuff going on. Who knew what was going to happen? And uh, that was the very picture of grace, too anticipate someone's anxiety and say something to say there's no anxiety. And uh, so, very, very happy to be here. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, everybody. Oh, um, thanks. Um, and Megan Marshall now. Well, I'm also very pleased to be here um, and to see all of you people. I haven't seen so many people in one place. I'm not one of these people who went to a family wedding of 150 people doubting whether it was safe. I, I didn't go to any of those weddings. <laughs> My family didn't have them. Um, I'm really proud to be in this volume and, I, and it's sort of by chance that, that I, my essay did land here. Um, the last time I was here, I think, at the museum was at an event honoring Bob Richardson, the wonderful biographer, who spoke, and we listened to his great late essay about, you know, what did the transcendentalists teach us after all anyway, and had great conversation, including with Bob Gross. Um, and then, maybe a year after that, Bob Richardson died. And it was through my writing a piece of remembrance that Andrew found um, in the literary hub that he got in touch with me. Um, and we were just writing about Bob, and then Andrew said, well, I'm working on this anthology. Do you have a, something you might contribute? And I said, well, no, you know, I don't have a lot to say about Thoreau. I write about the women. <laughs> Um, but I was, this is a story that, you know, my, my essay came into being sort of the opposite of the way that Kristen's did. She knew she was going to write this and she allotted three days for it and, and wrote something, a work of genius in three days. Um, I was, my partner had died about a year before this pandemic was really full blown and I was in the middle of mourning him and had found I hadn't been able to write much at all. Um, and so I began writing something that summer that ended up as the essay that has a little bit to do with Thoreau, but not, not a whole lot that Andrew was kind enough to take for this volume. And it 
takes off from that summer of the pandemic when we were all so uh, confused and mourning, mourning friends and family who died of COVID or other means and um, trying to find our way. And I found myself recalling a period of time when I had been lucky enough to be a visiting professor at Kyoto University and spent three months in Kyoto and ended up tracking, um, as I'll read a little portion of this, the, um, the, uh, the life of an earlier hermit like Thoreau, Kamo no, Chome, Kamo no Chome. Um, I had gone to Kyoto University not knowing anything about Japan. I was there to be an American literature faculty member and, and talk with graduate students. So everything that happened there was a complete surprise to me. I didn't know the language. I didn't know anything. And one of the things I also didn't know was I said, well, I'll come for the fall semester, September through November. And um, I didn't realize that in Japan their semesters go rather differently. So <laughs> I arrived September 1st and the university was closed. And I was by myself for about a month, and this this picks up from there. And I just want to say I'm I'm referring in the in this opening paragraph to a friend who died just at the beginning of the pandemic. But he wasn't dead when I at the moment that I write about here, 2017, far into September 2017, still lacking companionship. I looked up the ex-girlfriend of a lifelong friend of mine, an Indian architect with a talent for amicable breakups. He had former girlfriends all over the globe, it sometimes seemed, all of them brilliant, offbeat, and friendly to him still. This one was an American who'd moved to Japan 30 years ago and stayed there, marrying and raising a family in a village outside Kyoto, training as a no player, and eventually joining a professional troupe, a rarity for a woman, let alone a non-Japanese. We met only once for coffee, but our conversation shaped the remainder of my stay in Kyoto. Earlier that summer, and many of you will remember this summer of 2017, at a conference celebrating the bicentennial of Henry David Thoreau's birth, I'd learned of a Japanese hermit who, like Thoreau, had withdrawn to a handmade cabin in the woods and written about his experience. In the azure ceilinged Masonic Hall in Concord, Massachusetts, an audience of latter-day transcendentalists had listened as a Japanese scholar spoke of the Thoreau of Japan and showed us slides of a thatch-roofed dwelling, a replica like that of Thoreau's cabin by the parking lot at nearby Walden Pond. Despite my upcoming trip, I hadn't thought to ask more questions then. Now I did. Who was this hermit? Where was the replica of the hut? Might it be near enough to visit? That's how I first heard or learned the name Kamo no Chome and his book's title, Hojo Ki, The Ten Foot Square Hut. The book was a classic. All Japanese students read it, and Kamo no Chome, a disgruntled nobleman of the Fujiwara court, had renounced the world in Heian, Kyoto, more than 600 years before Thoreau took to the woods of Concord. The replica of his hut could be found on the grounds of a Shinto shrine not far from our coffee house where we were sitting that day, on a promontory formed by the convergence of the Takano and Kamo rivers, the latter providing the author's family name. So I went back to the uh, university library and checked out a copy of Hojo Ki. Hojo Ki begins with a brief preamble, an invocation of the Buddhist doctrine of impermanence setting the stage for Chome's choice to leave society and settle alone in the woods, a way of life he would not, like Thoreau, give up after little more than two years. The translators, Yasuhiko Moriguchi and David Jenkins, had rendered Chome's words in verse, and here are a few short stanzas, the beginning of, of the poem. The flowing river never stops, and yet the water never stays the same. Foam floats upon the pools, scattering, reforming, never lingering long. So it is with man and all his dwelling places here on earth. I liked the way Cho Mei raised questions, delicately and with poignance, that his unknowing spiritual descendant Thoreau answered centuries later with vehemence. And here's a little more Cho Mei, which you'll recognize as Thoreau. 
And so the question, where should we live? And how? Where to find a place to rest a while? And how bring even short-lived peace to our hearts? Chome's Hojo Ki was poetry. Thoreau's Walden, with its famously titled second chapter, Where I Lived and What I Lived For, was argument. When Thoreau retreated to Walden Pond in July 1845, he had only recently discovered Buddhism by way of a translation of the Lotus Sutra done by his transcendentalist colleague, Elizabeth Palmer Peabody, in The Dial, the first English translation of any Buddhist text. Thoreau had to plead his case for the simple life, for solitude as boon and balm, to the unconverted Americans of a go-ahead era when cities glittered in the popular imagination. Buddhism was in the air, for Chome breathed. Even if few practiced as extremely as he or the other rustic ascetics of his time, Chome addressed knowing readers with the confidence he would be understood, his choice accepted, even lauded. He could cajole and chant. He need not exhort. Without exciting curiosity or malicious jibes, as Thoreau had, he could make a remote cabin his home. And I'll just end with a few more lines from Ho Jo Ki. If your mind is not at peace, what use are riches? The grandest hall will never satisfy. I love my lonely dwelling, this one-room hut. Thanks. Hi, um, I'm Tatiana Schlossberg. Um, I always feel um, like a fraud when people who I don't know listen to me talk, but um, never more so than um, among a town of thorough experts. So um, hopefully, <laughs> um, I mean, I, I would hope to think that what I've written belongs in this volume, and I'm very flattered that, that Andrew thought it did. And, um, and I was really... Um, honor to, to get a chance to participate um, and also to, to sort of have the, the luxury and privilege to spend time um, with Thoreau's writing and, and, and thinking about um, how he connects to the world that we live in today. I, I write about climate change and the environment and um, I'm sure many of you know that um, you know, the records that he kept at Walden have formed some of sort of the, the best climatic records that we have of this area and proof that um, Massachusetts is, uh, I, th I believe, the second or, or third fastest warming state in New England, which is uh, one of the, the fastest warming regions in the country, if, if not the world. And so um, for all those reasons, it's incredibly um, powerful to get to engage with um, someone who made these these records that are so useful in ways that he could not possibly <laughs> um, have imagined, but are um, so so relevant, um, you know, for their scientific value as well as sort of the the poetry of seasons. Um, I also wrote about ice. Um, I'm going to read a little bit about um, ice, um, and it's sort of the the more depressing things, um, <laughs> the, that that aspect of it. Um, but I'll just begin with um, a, a part of the, what um, Thoreau writes in in Walden about. And I know I'm pronouncing it wrong, but I'll feel like even more of a fraud if I try to say thorough, because I'm not used to saying it that way. Um, uh, Thus it appears that the sweltering inhabitants of Charleston and New Orleans, of Madras and Bombay and Calcutta, drink at my well, Thoreau wrote toward the end of the chapter, the pond in winter in Walden. After watching Irish laborers harvest the glassy blocks of ice from the pond to send off to hotter climates. Um, in the morning, I bathe my intellect in the stupendous and cosmogonal philosophy of the Bhagavad Gita. I lay down the book and go to my well for water, and lo, there I meet the servant of the Brahmin, priest of Brahma and Vishnu and Indra, who still sits in his temple on the Ganges reading the Vedas, or dwells at the root of a tree with his crust and water jug. I meet his servant come to draw water for his master, and our buckets, as it were, grate together in the same well. The pure walled in water is mingled with the sacred water of the Ganges. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead, but um, I uh, 
anyway, for, for many people, I'm sure that, you know, thinking about the profundity of the spiritual and intellectual connection over space and time through the reading and contemplation of sacred texts from around the world uh, is what captivates them about this passage. Um, unfortunately for me, I remain focused on the ice. Um, I was born in 1990. Unlike Thoreau and unlike almost every generation before mine, I have only known a world where the amount of natural ice is disappearing in the hotter summers and alarmingly warmer winters as glaciers and ice caps melt. It's a world where Walden Pond doesn't freeze for the winter anymore. Instead, my world is one with few and distant memories of ice skating on frozen ponds. It's one where snow machines compensate for the declining snowpack, allowing skiers and snowboarders to imagine a different time with more reliable winters. It's a world where 90% of American homes have air conditioning, but in the hottest parts of the world, only 8% of the population does. Despite this perversion, ice disappearing from nature, machines make ice appear nearly instantly in many parts of the world. I had not thought much about where ice came from before refrigerators or how to make anything cold in a pre-industrial world. Um, that is all to say, before I read Walden, it had not occurred to me that even before a railroad linked Concord to Boston, blocks of ice could have been shipped from Walden Pond to India, perhaps, nestled in a jacket of insulating straw, twice crossing the equator and ending up clinked in a cocktail glass, cooling the elites of the British Raj, or as Thoreau suggests, the wealthy southern slaver in New Orleans, or the guru studying the Bhagavad Gita on the banks of the Ganges. And that led me to the story of Frederick Tudor, the mad ice king of New England, who made and lost and made again a fortune selling New England's ice to tropical climates, as well as to the courts of Europe. Queen Victoria, it is said, preferred Massachusetts ice. And who can blame her? Describing the towers of ice stacked high in Walden Shores, Thoreau wrote, at first it looked like a vast blue fort or Valhalla, but when they began to tuck the coarse meadow hay into the crevices, and this became covered with rime and icicles, it looked like a venerable moss grown in hoary ruin, built of azure tinted marble, the abode of winter, that old man we see in the almanac. Thoreau's ice is at once ephemeral and aged. I like this idea that ice is permanent and ancient, even when we know it is fleeting, because it reminds me that ice too has a memory. As snow falls on the ice sheets in the Arctic and Antarctic, air gets trapped in little pockets. As more snow falls, it weighs down the snow below it, trapping the air pockets too. These air pockets have the same chemical composition as the atmosphere when the snowfall traps them. And so the scientists, when they drill and pull out ice cores, use the air pockets in the ice to show how much carbon dioxide and other gases were in the atmosphere at a certain moment in time. We know much of what we do about the science of climate change because of the historical record the ice sheets contain, because of ice's ability to remember. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Wen, and um, I, uh, my essay is about what just about everything I've written for the last decade has been about, uh, which is <clears throat> coming to terms, really coming to terms, facing the brute facts. Um, the brutal injustice of uh, catastrophic climate change. Uh, not in some dystopian future, but happening right now. And um, uh, that book that uh, Andrew mentioned of mine starts off with an essay about Thoreau. And uh, I live down the road in Wayland, about six miles from here, and how I would walk to Walden from my, um, from my house and then walk home, and the, the start of my book is called Walking Home from Walden. Um, and my essay in this book is also about walking around Walden and elsewhere, Cape Cod, um, railroad tracks, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and how Thoreau has helped me front the fact of uh, climate catastrophe. Um, so I'm just going to read a kind of a condensed excerpt from the essay uh, uh, from the third, the last part of it, of the third, my third walk with Thoreau. The essay is called Walden at Midnight, Three Walks with Thoreau. <laughs> He's 
It's really surreal to read these next few sentences out loud. I've never read them aloud. <laughs> In the pre-dawn hours of Sunday morning, December 8th, 2019, I stood with a dozen others in the snow on the freight tracks in Ayer, Massachusetts, in front of a train carrying 10,000 tons of West Virginia coal. 10,000 tons of coal stopped by 12 human bodies, mothers and fathers, teachers, faith leaders, workers, young and old, for more than an hour. How long could we have stopped it had there been hundreds of us? Thousands. What would happen if enough people refused to allow the coal trains to pass? Let your life be a counter friction to stop the machine. Henry Thoreau wrote, in the radical abolitionist essay we know as civil disobedience. If he only knew what the machine would do, I envy him that he did not. In his fiery address, Slavery in Massachusetts, Henry wrote, I walk toward one of our ponds but what signifies the beauty of nature when men are base? It was not an idle question. Walked to Walden last night, moon not quite full, by railroad and upland woodpath, returning by the Wayland Road. Henry wrote in his journal entry for June 13th, 1851. Henry was given to walking at night. He even seemed to prefer it. His senses heightened in the dark. Late one night, near the end of October, almost exactly a year ago, I followed Henry's route. Heading south down the tracks from the edge of town, through the deep cut to Walden. It was very dark as I walked. Alone in the suburban woods in deep autumn silence, I had the pulse quickened sensation of being in the wild. And so there I was, purposefully striding down the same railroad Henry knew. And I began to think of the history of the railroad and all that it held, all that it signified. I thought of the Irish laborers fleeing famine who carved that cut and laid the tracks, and Henry's sympathy and charity toward their families, whose shacks were built into the hillside above the cove on Walden's northwest bank. I thought of the black fugitives fleeing north, whom Henry sheltered and discreetly assisted at no small risk, onto the trains for Canada. I thought of the Harper's Ferry conspirator, Francis Jackson Merriam, with a price on his head, whom Henry spirited out of Concord to the station in Acton the day after John Brown was hanged. And I thought of the locomotives, the steam and the coal smoke, the coal itself, the mines, the miners, of capital and labor, global industry and technological hubris, of empire and oil and Anthropocene. Half a mile down the tracks, the glow of Walden appeared through the trees serene and unmeasurable in the distance, and I saw what Henry meant about the water at night. I made my way along the northwest bank. A breeze picked up out of the north, sweeping the pond from Henry's Cove to the shore below the railroad tracks. 
My senses were alive and awake as I have rarely felt them. And to my surprise, I had no fear of the dark. We do not commonly live our life out and full, Henry writes after his night walk to Walden. We do not fill all our pores with our blood. We do not inspire and expire fully and entirely enough. We live but a fraction of our life. What is my life? What am I, if not my senses, my body? And what if a life lived out and full requires the readiness to risk it, to give that life entirely for something or someone beyond my small self, something transcendent, yet from which I am not separate? another person, all other persons. The moon was now hidden. The water at my feet was dark, deep, and clear. It was midnight, and I was alone with Walden. Thanks. I hope the Latin scholars here will forgive me, but I, I believe the expression is res ipsa locitor, um, the thing speaks for itself. Uh, that was that was dazzling. Um, I, I don't know when the last time was I've been in a room of this many people and heard such silence and such rapt attention, and, and also not seen a single person Oh, checking their phone or with any digital device seems very Thorovian, but uh, apropos. Um, it's also the first time I'll ever use two Latin expressions, I think, at one time, but I, um, I believe it's from the Latin, the word anthology uh, comes from a term loosely translated meaning bouquet. Um, this is certainly a beautiful bouquet um, tossed to Henry David Thoreau. Uh, and like you, Tatiana, I feel a little unsteady using the proper pronunciation if we use the Alcott and, and, and others, but um, I, I'm really taken aback by, by what just happened here. And, and um, I, I do want to say a, a couple of other things. I, was, I, I thanked the museum. I want to specifically thank Allison as well uh, for everything you did to make this night possible. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, Listening to these people it, it, it is a slightly bittersweet because uh, I drove up from New York City today and one of the things I occupied much of the time with was listening to the audio edition of the book, um, which is a completely different experience. Not completely, it's a very different experience. Uh, my only um, regret is that we didn't have all of you uh, read your own pieces because those were just beautiful renditions and readings. Um, um, you're just wonderful speakers as well, and those, there's often a disjunction between writers and the way they speak, whether they're reading their own. Um, but I guess this all speaks to the transcendence of, of Henry David Thoreau, who was the inspiration for, for so many people from Gandhi to John Kennedy to Martin Luther King to Tolstoy to the list goes on and on. Um, I, you know, I went into this project with some ignorance to some extent about Thoreau, um, limited in my knowledge, I think, like a lot of people. Uh, I didn't dislike him the way that, that Kristen did and a lot of others did. I didn't find Walden to be, I think as David Remnick said, just too difficult to get through or dense, I think it was, or something like that. But I didn't realize the scope. I think I bought into that sort of fallacy that Walden was Thoreau and Thoreau was Walden, not just even doing the simple math, as one of the contributors in the book uh, leads his or her piece with saying, it was two years, two months, two days, out of a life of about 44 years. There was a life before, there was a deep life that we know about, more about, 
during that time, and there was a life after. Um, one of the joys, or sort of psychic rewards for this project has, has been the sense of discovery about Thoreau. And, and it was many things from his sense of humor, um, which was a little bit sort of on display and manifested here. Um, the first time I read where, I think it was, someone will correct me, that, that Harvard offered him uh, a graduate degree, I think, um, for $5 for the diploma. And I think his line was, let every sheep keep its skin. Uh, and I think the night that he spent in jail, uh, was it that Emerson came to visit him and Emerson said, what are you doing in there? And Thoreau's response was, what are you doing out there? Um, you know, I, we, I think it was maybe mentioned a time or two here tonight, but his relationship with his brother John, uh, that in itself has, has, has such gravitas and profundity and meaning. And that was learning about that... Um, one of my best friends was named John, who was brother to me, and I think somewhere in this project he was um, a bit of an inspiration and influence. But that relationship alone uh, speaks volumes, and probably there should be a separate volume, and there have been, and there will be more. Um, with that, um, how are we on time? Do we want... So, okay, let's just pick up on that, and what surprised any of you about thorough as you, it's a lot of you did some heavy duty research or th deep thinking about this. Um, maybe any of you can speak to sort of what were, what was, were there any revelations or surprises um, about Thoreau? Um, <laughs> including, uh, well, take it however you'd like and, and anyone feel free to jump in here. Oh, sure. Okay. Okay. I just was surprised. I I always thought, and really growing up here, I just kind of got dragged. I got dragged to Thoreau on uh, field trips and stuff like that, and sort of you just things were named after Thoreau, and he was just around. But I always just assumed from the things that I had read that he had made himself incredibly clear and maybe too clear and um, that's a great thing to achieve clarity is a really really important thing but then he himself also talks about the need to kind of create a little more more spaciousness around your own writing that to allow for many interpretations or multiple interpretations and I find that the guy I, it was quite, quite a bit um, um, you're the Latin and Greek guy. I don't know if the name is if the, what the word is uh, gnomic is he sort of can, can he sort of edges into the gnomic a, a bit. All right. All right. Um, also, I think it was Bucky Dent, 1978. Is that right? Yeah. This, yes. So I was just, uh, I don't know if New London style pizza is still there. That, that When that happened, I was walking out to a car uh, outside of New London style pizzas. Thank you. I was surprised um, several years ago, many years ago now, when I read in the Harding biography about the melon parties. And I don't know if anybody knows more than I do about the annual, Thoreau's annual melon party to which he delivered invitations quite jovially around town. And he was sort of famous for this melon party. Um, and that really changed my, that was a moment where I was like, oh, the dude I've been imagining in my head didn't have an annual melon party. <laughs> this is like a different person. Um, so I don't know. Does anyone know much about the melon party? I don't know. Bob? <laughs> it's a great question, Andrew. I mean, I, I've always been, I'm constantly surprised at how funny he is. Uh, he has some amazing comic pieces, you know, set, set pieces, and so I read, read Cape Cod, which a lot of which is very dull, but there are also some great funny parts, and same in everything he wrote. Um, and then the other thing is how religious he was, you know, I wasn't really prepared for that when I came back to Thoreau after a long time, and not in any orthodox way, but like maybe in a, dare I say it, true way? <laughs> um,
Yeah, do we, can we take a, a question from the audience? If you want to shout it out? Or we yeah, why don't you shout it out and then you can repeat it. Go ahead. Today, I want to thank Dr. Wait, wait, this is too, gonna to be too good. I think you need the mic. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, today I took a walk at Brister Hill. I'm Nancy Tenney. I used to live in Concord for many years and now I'm in Maynard. And um, I was with a yoga teacher and many friends and he's apt to bring people on walks and I had really no idea we were gonna find Thoreau there in many of the beautiful carvings. Uh, there are, you know, strips of granite with his uh, really fantastic uh, selection. But the one selection of quote that I was so excited, I even did a drawing of it, and we were sitting in a circle where all the other great quotes are. John F. Kennedy is there, Mahatma Gandhi. And this quote really struck me because today is UN Day, and I'm... I have a great affiliation with the UN and my family. And so he says, could a greater miracle take place than for us to look through each other's eyes for an instant? Henry David Thoreau. Former uh, curator of special collections at, at Concord Free Public Library has a whole article about, um, you know, the, it, it came very close to having the UN buildings um, out where Hanscom Field is, I think, something like that. But I don't know too much more than that. But it's, it's good that you mentioned that in UN Day. It could have been here. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. Yeah. Um, what about the Walden Woods project? I mean, is that still thriving? I mean, um, I, I come to Walden at least three times a week to paddle and swim, and I have a frustration a little bit with the DCR. <laughs> um, and uh, just where, where do you all sit, sit with that in your minds about the Walden Woods project and what it did and how it maintained Walden? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a good point. Corinne, maybe you could speak on that. Uh, okay, I'm not a spokesperson for it, okay? I, I, I work at the shop at Walden Pond. Um, Walden Woods Project, um, your question is still, is it still going? Well, it happens every two years, apparently. The Walden Woods Project is a, is a non-profit organization. They have their... Um, they have their headquarters on, on top of Baker Farm Road, up above the, the pond. And it came about, real, real quick, it came about uh, in 1989, 1990, when a couple of projects were going to be uh, constructed at the intersection of 126 and 2, and also over in the Fairhaven Bay, uh, Fairhaven Road uh, thing, there was going to be a big office building at that at an intersection. Local people protested. Don Henley saw the protest on CNN, uh, offered to help. And so a whole big thing happened uh, that's, that doesn't describe it. But uh, out of that grew, and they had marches, and Christy Alley, and Ed Bagley Jr., and all kinds of other people came. And uh, out of that grew the Walden Woods Project. And what they do is they uh, have an educational uh, mission that is where the Thoreau Society archives are at the Thoreau Institute. Um, they have the biggest collection of Thoreau stuff there, but they also protect property around. In fact, they own the farm at Walden Woods that's on Route 2 next to the um, gas station and just uh, bought a parcel next to it. And so they're protecting um, property that is around the park. Okay, the state park is, is where Walden is. Uh, how many acres is the? 325? 325 acres of the, of the park. But Walden Woods Project has been buying up and protecting some of the other, project, other things. 
That's 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 a sure thing. So they 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 still exist. Thank you, Corinne. Yes. My question is actually for you, and if you could tell us a little bit about how this whole project came about, and how you selected the people that are in the book. Thank you. How I selected the people in the book, you just, <laughs> you, know how, you know why I chose six of the people now, having just yeah. heard what we heard. Um, well, I, I spoke a little bit about the inception of the project, um, not being catalyzed by COVID, but, um, it was it was deep seated, and it was it started with Walden as it does with so many people. Um, but I, I don't know the proper sort of metaphor or analogy. But I think COVID just sort of narrowed the prism and really put into focus sort of put a premium putting a premium on what really mattered or what mattered most. And um, this is not what I do, but this is one of the things that I do. Um, but like a lot of people with a lot of projects, I think each time you do one, you say, this is my last one. And, and, and this is my eighth anthology, um, I think, eight and a half. Uh, well, it's a co-edited one uh, about baseball. The last one before this was about peanuts. Uh, the one before that was about uh, the Beatles. And, and actually, there's a, there's a continuum here to some extent in that I think with at least those last two, it happened, I think the Beatles book came out on the 50 year anniversary of uh, Sgt. Pepper. And the Peanuts book came out, I think on the 80th, a big anniversary of Peanuts. And it sort of begged this question of like, are we in a new Beatles moment? Was it a new Peanuts moment? Or was it just sort of a 50 year ongoing moment? And that's 80 year. So I guess with Thoreau, are, are we in a Thoreauvian moment now? Or have we just been in one long 160 year? To, I don't want to dodge your other question. Uh, the, the, um, so it just kind of, it takes, it sounds sort of trite, but it's actually true that the idea just sort of takes hold and doesn't let go and you give it time to kind of gestate and if it feels like something you have to do, then you try to do it. But And how to pick the people, I mean, it's the same guiding principle with this as it's been with the others, which is um, tell a story that people already know or think they know and try to tell it in a different way. Uh, try to tell it in a new way. Try to tell it through a kaleidoscopic uh, lens, sort of a tapestry of pieces. The, 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 the Latin thing, whether that was accurate or not, about a bouquet. Um, you know, try to get a diversity of voices, opinions, uh, experiences. Um, there's a very uh, strong stigma against this form of book. Uh, in in I, I, my day job, as it were, is as a literary agent representing authors and their own books. Um, but this is, these are just labors of love and pet projects. And I just at once every couple of years, there just is some theme or topic that just sort of grabs on and doesn't let go. I, I don't know that that really answered your question. Uh, but again, like what was on display here is, is again, it's six out of 27 of the contributors. And I, I take zero credit for sort of handpicking and, and sort of curating this particular group for this particular night. But it actually works beautifully as far as sort of, I think, manifesting the substance and style and the wit and the wisdom and, uh, um, you know, even though it's, my math is not that good, 20% or something like that of the contributors. So thanks for that question though. Um, Megan, did you have to say something? You were uh, talking a bit about surprises and about the anthologies that you have done. Um, I, like many here, I first uh, encountered Thoreau in high school reading Walden, but my next real encounter after that was as a, a college student, I was working as a freelance editor for a PhD, someone who had a PhD and was turning her uh, PhD dissertation into a book which was written in the 1970s all about Thoreau as a, as a member of the human community and it was always about his relationships, that he wasn't the loner that we think of him as being. And I think that's something that we're seeing in this anthology and in this interest in Thoreau right now. And here you did Peanuts, you did the Beatles, these are groups. In some ways, um, Thoreau was a person uh, of, of this town, as we see in Laura Walls's biography, very much part of his world, part of the, you know, not just the natural world, that, well, the whole ecosystem. Um, and I think that's one of the great aspects of your anthology, and you've brought us all 
out of the woods, out of our homes here tonight. So thank you for that. Well, thanks. I mean, it, thank you. It does, it does engender a question of like what else we six or you six, we seven or you six have in common, um, but it is a great democratizer. I mean, it says it, it's it's said about baseball. I mean, I did want back to your question a little bit. I mean, I could go one by one because there's a story um, basically behind each one. It's not there's no clearinghouse where you go to sort of. Well, there is great American essays. You could just sort of comb that list. But I, what I try to do is take people who are expert in the particular field, known for that field, and also purposely try to have a population of people who are who are decidedly not in that group. But I mean, again, if I went through this, uh, Will's play, Will and I met in person, I think the only other time was 17 years ago. Um, and I respect him so much as a, as a playwright. George's books, um, I've read, I think every single one of them. Tatiana, I used to read in the New York Times. You know, I could just go sort of one by one and it's, it, it, it was 26 or 27 different stories. Um, so anyway. Yeah, so um, with that, I just want to thank everyone again. Um, the museum, Concord Museum, Thorough Society, Princeton University Press, everyone here on this panel, all of you, um, I can't thank you enough. It really means a lot. And um, I want to uh, turn it over to Rochelle Johnson, who's the president of the Thorough Society, uh, with my great gratitude for what you do. Thank you. Thank you again. You've all been sitting for a long time, and we're so grateful that you're, that you're here. Uh, my name is Rochelle Johnson, and I have the honor of being the 41st president of the, the Thoreau Society. The Society exists to do what we're doing here tonight, and, and what Andrew is doing, and these authors are doing, and that is to, uh, to stimulate and celebrate interest in the life and works and legacy of Henry David Thoreau. The Society has members uh, worldwide in um, 50 countries, Penobscot Nation, all of, uh, 20 countries, sorry, 20 countries, the Penobscot Nation, all 50 US states, um, over 1,500 members. And I say that to reiterate what Andrew just um, said so eloquently, and that is uh, Thoreau is so relevant to our times um, on, on the globe in every way, social justice, um, deliberate removal from society that we're all engaged in now, and of course, environmental concern. I want to say some um, some thanks, uh, as as Andrew did, to Tom and Tom Putnam and Allison Schilling for having us. The Thoreau Society is always delighted to partner with the Concord Museum. Um, thanks too to Jody Price, who's been mentioned, but uh, her work at Princeton University Press made this event entirely possible. I want to thank Michael Frederick, the executive director of the Thoreau Society. Yes. <laughs> charts the course, keeps the ship going. Uh, and also um, China Lemire and Corinne Smith, who will be selling books in the hallway, so be sure to get your copy of this excellent anthology. Um, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, panelists. Uh, fabulous presentations tonight, and we're all looking forward to reading the full versions of the essays. I also want to invite you all later this week on Friday night, the Thoreau Society will be awarding the Henry David Thoreau Prize in Literary Nature Writing to Robin Wall Kimmerer, author of Braiding Sweetgrass. That's an event that will happen in person at First Parish Church, uh, masked, distanced, safe, but also online, so you can register register at the Thoreau Society website for uh, either, either form of that venue. Congratulations on your very fine volume. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us tonight. Now comes good sailing.